everybody today on youtube how we doing so we're come back with a second video and we'll show you our system here we had had a few questions we're also in the middle of upgrading so we have a new drive wheel that we're putting on because the old one had a repair on it which is right there you can see where we braised it up uh it's worked very well however it's just uh, minutely off balance. So that being said, come back to the mill here. We want to replace this. We have two new bearings that we're gonna put on this. Fairly inexpensive for the bearings. Um, these are showing possibly a little sign, not too bad, a little sign of wear. It's 100 plus hours, which is not bad, but with that wheel being off balance, it possibly is shown this rear bearing here does have a little it's pretty good too actually so look, we're going to replace them why not so one of the questions that we had was this system this here is a two and a half inch scheduled 40 tube this was a galvanized pipe uh came from an electrical conduit this is almost it's about three sixteenths wall so it's pretty heavy duty this was a three and a half inch pipe that we've turned down on our lathe Right here, you can see we made plastic bushings. This came from a gas line just because it was something we had. It was a heavy wall plastic gas line. It was blue. Um, but the first ones we made came from a piece of Schedule 40 pipe. They worked well, too, but the gas line was a better it was a better plastic I thought was going to last longer. You can see we just have a little welded tab right here that just holds us down. So this is in a shape of an L. The inside piece is thinner, making up the difference between this pipe and this pipe, than what this is. So this little flange that we have machined on this plastic with our lathe just keeps this in. And then we also cut a slit in the plastic this way so that we could squeeze it over top and then slide it down in and then remove it if need be. Uh, it just gives us the ability to open the plastic up and that works pretty well. You can see how we have this tube is welded to these quarter inch plates. And then this is tapped, this whole system is tapped. So this six bolts here gives us the ability for this head to move up and down and give us any slight adjustments. We really didn't need to do that like what we thought we were going to, but we had anything you build, you wanna to try to build any, something with an adjustment in it. So that's what we did but we also have the adjustment right here that gives us the ability to, from our chain drive system, to lower this head, raise it lower, whatever it may be, to make it parallel with the bed. But then we also have the adjustments on the Cook's Sawmill blade guides, which I can't speak highly enough about them. I mean, these blade guides, I mean, are wonderful, you know. We, we grease them every now and then. Uh, just put one shot of grease in there. You don't want to over grease them. You don't want a bunch of grease just blowing out of those bearings. Uh, there's no sense in that. Just like a half a pump of grease every few hours of use. One thing that we did not point out in our other video, so when we originally made this, this is about, well, it's the width of this four-inch tube. And this whole thing would fill up with sawdust. And then when you were sawing, well, I mean, you can see some sawdust in here now. Um... When you were sawing, you would get some sawdust that came around this, this way here with the blade, and it would pick up some of the pile of dust from the wind, and it was taking it back around. It just had a lot more airborne sawdust. So we then added this plate at a later date to close this gap, and that cut down a lot of the sawdust, uh, airborne sawdust. So that's just one thing here give a close-up of our wicking system this side is water drips right on the blade this side over here I mean I know it's covered in sawdust right now but this tube right here is diesel fuel and the diesel fuel comes out and just drips into this metal box we have made this is full of a wick it's a felt and that felt wipes the blade your pitch builds up mostly on the inside of your blade when you're cutting that diesel fuel keeps the blade lubricated. We use that mostly in the, your colder months when you have to worry about your water freezing. However, 
we still do use water, soap, water, pine salt, something like that for most of our lubrication, which helps keep the blade cooler, I feel, than the diesel fuel. But the diesel fuel is about, you're not gonna find anything that lubricates better than the diesel fuel. Uh, this tube that we've put on here, right here is where we fill our diesel fuel up. We filled this tube up probably three quarters of the way I don't know, a couple of gallons maybe when we first built this sawmill. I think I've, I don't think I've even put any back in it yet since then. Maybe a gallon, but not much. It takes absolutely nothing really to keep this blade lubricated. That drips ever so slightly on that wick. We never see any diesel fuel on our lumber. Uh, we never see it spraying around, anything like that. So yeah, good system to me, I feel it is. Up here, this mechanism we've had a question on. So if you can, sp to the left here was a fuel pump, electric fuel pump that we had originally on this engine. This is a Predator Harbor Freight, 22 horsepower. Uh, the engine has performed very well. It does great with power, plenty of power to cut our max width, which is 37 and a half. But you can see here, we have a spring and this is a throttle system going up to the carburetor when we pull our lever mechanism down here it idles your engine up to we're about 3400 we run this engine at a little over 3400 is where it kind of lies and we give ourselves multiple adjustments here on this system this lever here that goes over is when we pull that down that's pulling this this way engaging the throttle at the same time and also our idler pulley, which tensions our belt. So all in one pull uh, works pretty well. Obviously this is not our idea, but we did do away with the electronic fuel pump. It was overloading the float and that's only like a gallon per minute pump. That's the smallest pump I could find. It was overloading the float in the carburetor, flooding it. Yeah, that, that didn't work so well, but I did find multiple information that said that the Fuel, the manual fuel pumps that come on these engines don't work very well. So I did away with that originally, thinking that I was gonna have to do that. And eventually I just did away the fuel pump, was not working well, the electric one. And I hooked the original one up and for a, over a year now, the original fuel pump that came with this engine has been doing a great job. I do have on my shelf up in my storage or my work area a i ordered another briggs fuel pump manual that i read was a good replacement but i've yet to have to do that so who knows we're changing our drive pulley at the same time we've got our axle pulled out we're going to change this over to a dual belt system now it's not going to be a dual bonded belt where both belts are attached together it's going to be two single individual belts um, I did have a good, somebody pointed out in the comments that when you're shutting this off with a dual bonded belt, it's going to have a tendency to still want to spin your blade. And I was going to originally put a brake on this system, a uh, hand brake, like off an old bicycle or, or, or something, but I didn't do that. And I've, I've not needed that with the single belt, but the point that was being made was that if I switched to a dual bonded belt, it's gonna to wanna to have a tendency to not slack at the engine and not slack at this pulley because it would ride in the middle of the pulley, if that makes any sense. And it would wanna have a tendency to spin. So if somebody pointed that out, that made immediate sense to me. So we're not gonna, we'll just do two individual belts then. And two individual belts should work fine with being able to slack. We hope. One other question that I had was with this driving system. So you can see here, I don't know if I'm putting this out well enough in the first video, but it's attached to the rear of the sawmill. It comes to the front, drives around just a cheap, inexpensive pulley. Uh, this, real, this system really could use an upgrade, but it's worked well for a year. We have plans of putting electric motors on this for drive units with chains and everything else, but it really works well. And we haven't got to that point yet because this works well 
So for those of you out there that might be looking at just making a simple manual mill, I, I really, I, I, I like this system. So this cable is under, is under some tension. So we have it tight. At this side of the mill, we have it attached like the rear side of the mill, but we have a turnbuckle up here that we can tighten this cable. So it just goes around the bottom, up over this. This is about a four and a half inch pulley. And we have the cable tight so that the cable will dig into this pulley so that when we're manipulating this handle forward and reverse, uh, it gets enough friction in there to be able to do it. And that doesn't slip at all. So I'm surprised by that. So it goes under, up over this, back down around another one, and back out to the front. That works really well. This was another question. So these springs here in the front, there's a little nub that's welded here top and bottom. These springs are approximately this long. And they're an 800 pound spring. Uh, it's like a 3 8 diameter. I forget the exact load, but anyways, these two springs just rest on top of those little nubs to keep them from going up and down. And then inside here, there's a shaft on the top and in the bottom, the same location as the springs, but this shaft is not, it's a separate shaft than that little nub. So this shaft here has a flange that's welded, you know, was milled onto this in the lathe and it's bigger, it's a diameter of the outside of the spring. So this right here goes so far, touches the spring, and these can work in this conjunction to keep tension on the springs, which in return pushes this whole mechanism with the bearings and this right here, it goes all the way around. This hydraulic jack is pushing out here, which is pulling this whole mechanism under tension. We tension at 2,500 PSI, I find that to work pretty great. We've yet to ever b break a blade in uh, well over a year and a half's time of, of milling. And we drilled into this hydro, this was a new hydraulic jack that we took all apart. This on threads, there's plenty of videos on YouTube of how you can drill in here with an eighth inch hole. Now this is an eighth inch pipe tap right here, quarter inch pipe tap for a quarter inch pipe. You could use eighth inch, but we drilled down the eighth inch drill bit down into the base here. This is cast iron. And then we drilled another eighth inch hole this way to connect these two holes at 90 degrees, which then will allow fluid to return and come up here. And the gauge will let you know. It's nice to have a gauge to constantly let you know what your tension is. So that you're always going the same because of tracking and you, they're just of reasons of that. So uh, we extended this little T handle off the original uh, open and shut valve. We have ourselves a handle here where we can tension this up. It will push this unit out. Uh, works pretty well. When we originally made this, we had this one shaft on this one side, linear bearings inside of here. Uh, works very well with keeping, you know, this nice and parallel top and bottom, but it also was pulling the head unit in that direction under load. It was very minimal, but it was enough that I was concerned. So we added this another rod, and then we tied the two together, and it helped share the load between these two rods. Uh, that was just kind of an afterthought design, but uh, it, it does work very well that way. If I was to do it again, I would have more linear bearing on both sides. Um, and this was a chrome rod of some sort that we had, so we use it. Uh, I think that that might touch base on all of the things that were of question in comments. I will post another video as this repair goes along. We're making a whole new shaft. It's just how it is. Then uh, this side is working well. We've got four new bearings. We've already installed the two new bearings on this side. Uh, when the in between this bearing flange. And the front bearing flange, we have a sleeve that's milled from this point to the front point, and it slides over top of this axle. And it's the exact dimension from the back side of this bearing flange to the back side of that bearing flange. That allows these. I don't have. I don't have these set screws tight. If you tighten these set screws, it's going to want to pull this bearing flange in this direction away. Even though it might be, this shaft is a very tight fit in here, but it's still, over time, on the first shaft, why we had to 
replace the bearings, they were showing ever so slight signs of wear. And that was because I didn't have a bushing in between those two. So this system right here, when you tighten this, it, it can off kilter this bearing housing just a little bit, if that makes any sense, which over time is back and forth, back and forth, back and forth at a high RPM. And it just hammered away at this axle ever so slightly, which as it got a little worse and just kept getting worse and worse. I was surprised I took it apart. This axle right here had about a 16th of an inch just hammered away on it. There was nothing there. Um, it smashed that whole, hammered that whole axle down. So when we did the bushing in between the two, these right here ride true parallel with the axle shaft. We have no problems. Uh, it's just really nice and smooth. So you live and you learn. And that's something that we, you know, when you're making something yourself, it just, yeah, that's what happens. There's things that you got to improve upon, and, and that was one of them. So we have two new bearings for that side that we're going to replace because we bought them in a set of four. So why not replace them now? And um, they're showing a little signs of wear, but not bad, really. Over 120 plus hours or something use on this, and which is quite a bit really because again this is a hobby for us we're we're not doing this for a business we're doing this just because we're woodworkers and we always wanted a sawmill so we were going to build it quite a bit smaller we're glad we didn't it's really awesome to be able to build or cut stuff that's wider and this head unit is extremely stout so i didn't want something that was flimsy cutting through logs and this is by far not flimsy at all. So I'm glad that I invested the time and the money into making this beefier. For sure. All right. Well, so I hope that that might help anybody with a few of the questions. Right here, I don't know if you can see. Maybe I didn't show this in the first video. So you can see these little bolts. Right here is a tube. We also have a corresponding tube right there. So when that head unit is pulled up and it's just a little bit forward of the axle that goes on this, then we put our pin in through this way, cotter pin, lock it down, and that ensures that our head stays, you know, where we need it to be for going down the road. You can see these locations right here. This is where we put our axle on. So we occasionally have taken this out on the road to go help friends, um, which is pretty neat for us because this is, we, in, we just love obviously to share this because it's a hobby. So, all right. Thanks everybody. We hope that that answers any questions. And if not, why don't you ask me in my comments and I could try to do my best to answer them. I hope everybody liked this and if you don't mind, maybe subscribe to the channel. We're going to keep posting videos of running this. We've got quite a, quite a bit of nice walnut we want to cut. We've got some nice white oak that we're going to show some quarter sawing videos. And we'll go from there. Thanks, everybody.